Hello. And also, hello. Welcome back to the Epic of Glilgamesh, where today we'll be discussing the least controversial episode of The Dragoner Show, like normal people might. Wait, they released episode 9 right after episode 8? It's a bit predictable, but okay, it's your show, I guess. Credits time, here are the credits. No! Viserys, no! I thought he was just sleeping! We finally get new thingies for Alicent's kids, and Daron isn't even invisible, just this once. Oh, and there's Helena's kids too, neat. HBO, you have one more chance to give me new music. Do you have any idea how much procrastinating it takes to make these a cappella songs? I don't care what you say anymore, this is my life. What's that? It's the Paperboy with today's The News, and it has a headline on it. And that headline says, hey, you guys, the king is like, dead? And obviously I didn't actually read the article itself, so we'll just roll with that. So that's what this episode's deal is. We're gonna hang out with some dudes while they try to figure out how to live in a viserisless world. The notable thing about this episode is that it completely ignores like half the main characters. We're just chilling in King's Landing, so we only follow the Greens shenanigans as they scramble to figure out how best to go about shitting all over a dead man's wishes. I really like the through line that Alicent is legitimately compelled by her misinterpretation of of Viserys' last words to her. She thinks he meant to name their son Aegon his heir when really he was trying to tell Rhaenyra that she's the epic Keanu Reeves of this universe. So Alicent's going around telling everyone Aegon is Viserys' chosen heir and they're all like, okay, whatever lets you sleep at night. Even Aegon's like, dude, that guy hated me and there's no way he wanted me to be king. And yet every powerful person in the city, Otto, Thailand, Jasper Wilde, Orwile, crispy chicken tenderloins in a large meal for $8.99, Coke Zero for the drink, thanks, see you at the next window. They all still conspire to make Aegon King for their own political and personal gain. The only people with any power who don't play along with this are Harry Westerling, Lord B! Princess Rhaenys, and to a lesser extent, Eric Cargill. Missaria seems to not give a shit who the king is, seems like she'd rather see the whole institution completely destroyed, but she works with a faction of the Greens for her own political ends as well. I've said in the past that this franchise is working at its best when the personal interacts with the political, and that's what's going on here. The episode's premise is solid. It's sort of an examination of what it means to all of these people for Aegon to be made king, and that's pretty interesting, especially for me when it comes to Alicent, Aemon, and Aegon himself, and we'll get to all that, but I guess I'm doing a broad analysis thingy right now. Where the episode begins to falter though is the specific mechanics of the plot. The main conflict is this race between Otto and Alicent to secure possession of Aegon, who, much like Carmen San Diego, is on the run, up to some manner of nefarious crime, and hidden behind a number of arbitrary fetch quests and contrived puzzles. Getting to Aegon first has the stated consequence of being the person in charge of him and therefore the kingdom. Otto and Alicent have different ideas of how to go about handling the coronation and policy concerning Rhaenyra's family. Otto sees that the only way to prevent a full-scale war is to swiftly eliminate Rhaenyra's rival claim, but Alicent is still clinging to the idea that conflicts can be avoided through personal means, so that's why it's important. What ends up happening is Alicent wins the race, spoilers, and so she gets to decide what happens. I have her gone. We'll proceed now as I see fit. But I think this is weird because, well, if you make Aegon king, then, you know, he's the king. Doesn't that mean that he gets to call the shots? Like, I get that influence over the king is extremely valuable, but I think it's just a bit simplified that the whole thing boils down to whoever ends up with Aegon in their inventory when the timer expires. That is, however, how it works, apparently. Does Otto really just stop trying to get what he wants simply because Alicent got to talk to Aegon first and the coronation? wasn't as flashy as he wanted. The whole sequence is still fun to watch, it's just I don't know, it sort of feels a bit hollow. But if you think about it in terms of character, there's a lot of very cool stuff going on here. You know what, this one's gonna be looser in form. I'm just talking about shit at this point. Pull up a chair, get comfy, put your feet up, take your shoes off. Oh, on second thought. Let's not do that. The mere fact that nobody knows where Aegon is in the first place indicates that no one really cares about him as a person. Lots of powerful people think Aegon is the heir to the throne and no one knows where he is. And I won't blame them, he sucks. But perhaps his sucking is due at least in part to nobody caring about him. It's one of them snakes that gobbles its own tail or something. A negative feedback loop-de-loop -loop in the middle of the roller coaster of Aegon's self-regard. To find him, Aemond, Bill, Bill. 
Cal and the Cargill twins have to go through Aegon's personality, the places he goes and the things he likes to do. Sir Eric only knows things about him because it's his job to put up with his shit, and Aemon only knows anything because he's forced to be his brother. And what do we find out about Aegon? Well, in addition to fucking, he enjoys watching kids beat the shit out of each other, possibly his own kids. The sadism on display makes a comparison to King Joffrey quite natural, but I think there's a notable difference. Joffrey was shown to actively seek out inflicting harm onto others himself, whereas when Aegon hurts others, he seems to be completely oblivious to his doing that. The girl he raped, he thought it was just harmless fun. He didn't intend on ruining her life, he didn't understand what he was doing to her. Joffrey not only understood that he was hurting other people, he loved hurting other people. That's like his thing. His hobby. Tommen does gymnastics, Marcella has ballet, and Joffrey hurts people. They are, however, both the products of ultimate privilege combined with parental neglect and a society that glorifies violence and views women as places for men to have sex at. Narcissists that find no genuine recognition from anyone, except occasionally Joffrey's mother tells him he's the coolest because he's her access to power. Aegon's nature is never rewarded by his family, whereas Joffrey is coddled. So when Aegon is presented, with great power, he tries to run from it, but Joffrey is fully prepared to take it. But when Aegon unsheathes the Conqueror's Blade at the Dragon Pit and is met by thunderous approval from the common folk, for the first time being accepted, albeit by people who do not know him, he does embrace power. Because maybe through kingship, Aegon will find recognition and love, things he's never experienced before. Mainly though, I just wanted to show this art of Aegon and Joffrey being best friends, because like all of Francie's work, it's gorgeous, and you should follow her. It's given through free bomb. Yeah. And the contrast with Rhaenyra couldn't be any clearer. Their wants are of no consequence. <laughs> Rhaenyra's desire for the throne was given to her by their father. Aegon's desire for the throne was given to him by them. I should stress that really none of this characterization is in the book. All we really hear is that he initially says, I thought Rhaenyra was the heir, and then he's crowned and he does laps in the car park on his sick ass dragon. There's so much more to him as a character in the show. Of course, in the show, he doesn't get to do his cute little victory laps on Sunfire, who we've barely seen at all so far. Instead, the coronation is gate crashed by Rainey's pulling a vertical Kool-Aid man. Oh, yeah. Now, a lot of hot air has been blown up about this, and there's a lot going on. It's the culmination of a little arc between Rainey's and Alison we'll talk about later, in addition to Rainey's overall story. It's a huge disruption to the plot that sees the Green's plans utterly shaken. It's an enormous departure from what we're told happened in the Beck, but most importantly, it's women ruining Game of Thrones. Oh god, guys, do we really have to. First, there are some people who say that Rhaenys had no choice, that this was Rhaenys' only way out, so let's examine the mechanics. Just so we're all on the same page, the coronation is happening in the Dragon Pit, the huge dome building atop different Rhaenys' hill, where we saw Rhaenyra drop off Cyrax at the very start of the show. It seems there are at least two levels to the Dragon Pit, the big chamber accessed by the main entrance, where we also saw the boys in episode 6, and that's where Aegon is crowned, and the catacombs below that level, where Aemon saw Dreamfire. As as we saw in the first episode, the catacombs have their own external exit out the back. In the hubbub of the coronation, Rainy sneaks off down to the catacombs, where her dragon Melis is kept in long-term parking. It's unclear how the dragon keepers would have reacted to her, like if they would have just let her out. The dragon pit was designed to keep the dragons in, after all. But we must not forget that there is an external exit from the catacombs that was an option. Rainy's did not have to burst through the ceiling and fly out the main doors. That isn't how dragons use usually leave the pit. Could you imagine if they had to repair the whole fucking building every time? I hope the dragon keepers have a strong union. So that's that. Rainy's had a choice, and she chose to break through the floor and kill a bunch of innocent bystanders, some of whom may have been cool, which is not very on the vibe of her. Um, does Rainy's know that terrorism is wrong? On the other hand, there are people who say that she had no reason to make this choice. I think this is a far more reasonable thing to wonder about. This universe has made it clear that that for people in positions of power, whether or not they care what happens to poor people seems to be a toss-up. Some of them do care, 
others simply don't. Rhaenys has consistently been shown to only really care about her own immediate family, and even expresses callous disregard for the feelings and desires of others. She also doesn't really have a position of power in King's Landing and plans on immediately leaving, so to her knowledge she won't suffer any foreseeable consequences for this action. If she really wanted to make a stand against Aegon and answer Alicent's question and remind the people of the world what Targaryen power means, I could absolutely see someone as detached and singularly driven as Princess Rhaenys doing something this cold, evil and destructive. Earlier, Alicent gave her a choice, gave her directions, but she is Rhaenys Targaryen and nobody tells her where she can go and when. On the other hand, you've got three hands. I've got three hands. There's a small niche of people who think that not only was it reasonable for the character to do this, it was the right thing to do. And I should make it clear that no, it is not okay to intentionally kodinka someone's party, no matter how cool it makes you look in gifts. You should have been queen. A true queen counts the cost to her people. <laughs> I've got one more hand, and it's full of a strangely specific group of people. Once Rhaenys kills a bunch of normies, she stares the entire green faction down, has Melis roar at them, <laughs> and then just fucks off, without even killing them all. A true girl boss would have raised the whole building to the ground, but no. Even if she did ever intend on actually killing them, she sees Alicent standing up for her family the same way she would stand up for hers, recognises that this isn't her fight, and accepts the way out that Otto made for her. The real fight for Rhaenys, of course, is against the peons of King's Landing. Also, she doesn't want to be a kinslayer and a kingslayer, not to mention that even more hell would break loose if she killed the two dragon riders there. We have previously seen dragons reacting to the deaths of their riders, so that's something. I think the bigger issue here is why? Why did they write this? Like, I clearly don't think it's the worst thing ever, it's certainly nowhere near as stupid as what these frat boys ended up doing, but it's one of those concerning scenes I mentioned earlier. I can definitely see how this change provides some foreshadowing for a very big event that will be happening later in the show, but here at Gliscor we do not spoil. You heard me. I evolved. They can't very well come out and say, oh yeah nah, this is actually a really good idea because it sets up can they? Behind the scenes material reveals that apparently someone in the writer's room felt they needed a big dramatic statement to end episode 9, which I get. We knew we needed a penultimate scene. Oh, well, it'll be the coronation, etc. And, and I just kept thinking to myself, we got to do better than this. And they came up with this sudden burst of violence and a tense moment where Rhaenys might just end it all, and then she doesn't. A kind of oh fuck scene that kicks the audience's collective dick a little bit. That's a worthwhile feeling to evoke, and it's sort of a tradition in this franchise to do something enormous in the penultimate episode of a season, but I feel there's a middle ground they could have found. It would be awesome if Rhaenys just came through the floor on a dragon. It went in immediately and we never looked back. Have Rhaenys leave out the back, but then as Aegon steps out to address an even greater crowd of small folk hailing him as king, they all turn away from him to see the Red Queen Melee soaring through the sky in a show of her power, blaring flame to signal the coming war. Or something else. Ultimately, I think writers might need to shut the fuck up just a little. Doing these little featurettes tends towards reducing the story's depth. Let the story speak for itself, and the people who didn't get all of it will just log on to youtube.gov and watch an Alt Shift X video. Just let him take care of it. Did you not learn your lesson? While well, Danny kind of forgot about the Iron Fleet and Euron's forces, they, they certainly have forgotten, forgotten about, about, her, about her. As is, we're left with what could be described as the fatal flaw of the season, do you get it? Devoid of any context, everything that happens in the scene is extremely fucking cool. But there is context, and though I, the viewer, can kind of come up with a reason for why Rhaenys might be okay with killing all these people, but not the terrible king she supports the rival claimant of, it's admittedly a stretch, and I really shouldn't have to plug that hole for the story. It seems that Spectacle got the best of them this time, even though it wouldn't have taken that much effort to write something far more sensible at the cost of a bit of pageantry. Again, it's not the most egregious thing, but it is shaky, and it's representative of a tendency to prioritise epic moments, vibes based writing. So that's why some people think this scene fucking sucks, and other people think it's totally awesome. As for me, 
I'm neither. I'm both. I can't choose. I'm bisexual. We established this. Of course, the biggest criticism of the scene should be that Rhaenys isn't even wearing a helmet when she crashes through hundreds of tons of stone. Wait, wouldn't all of this have fallen on the other dragons in the pit too? We know Vagar is too big for the pit. But too large for the dragon pit. But what about Sunfire and Dreamfire? Shouldn't they, like, react? To this, the one last thing I want to talk about in this weird freeform section of the video is Quenstrong Laristino. Luris Strong K. Larvi Weinstrom. There's so much more going on in this scene, but nobody seems to give a shit because the weirdo has a foot fetish and we live in a society. I love that this is actually a piece of continuity. Like, they really thought this one through. Is it sort of deranged that the one physically disabled character on the show has a sexual fetish that mirrors his disability? Look. Probably. It's a little fucked. But moreover, it seems that Laris gets off on the power dynamics of it all. Now, I'm normal, so I don't really get what constitutes sexy feet. But even if Laris thinks these meet the criteria, it's more important to him that he, a man extrinsically defined by his physical incapabilities, has control over and can demean Alicent, one of the most powerful women on the planet. Actor Matthew Needham says it's about making her feel as much shame for her feet as he does for his. She's very obviously humiliated by the whole affair. This is the same dissociative look she made when Viserys would fuck her. Wait, that was a different actor. God, they did that well. But is this Larry Strong's ultimate motivation? Did he murder his entire family for feet pics? Nah. I think this is just an extension of the leverage he has over Alicent, a display of his control. Or maybe, like Viserys' crown falling off his head, or that horse's dick in Game of Thrones, this was simply improvised. Actors are creative people you know. You gotta listen to their input sometimes. One day this chair will be mine. Can't believe I managed to sneak in one of my world famous non-linear reviews into this season. Hell yeah. Now we're gonna go through chronologically and just rattle some thoughts off, seeing as I front loaded the video with all the big news. Oh, one last thing. Um, Olivia Cook is just brilliant. Just like Game of Thrones first season, it's so great that HBO is bringing some lesser known talent to the fore, like Millie Alcock, or Ewan Mitchell, or Matt Smith. And the guy who plays Caraxes. <laughs> Fun fact, same actor. All right, from the top, people. Raman Jawadi has a message for us, and that message is G. We see the news of the king's death travel through the keep over this honestly beautiful music. This motif has been associated with Viserys and his struggle throughout the season. But here, we hear the melody played on solo piano for the first time, and only time, and first time. The piano is an extremely versatile instrument that could be used in all sorts of settings. There's a dense, centuries-long tradition of writing pieces in all sorts of moods and styles for just the piano or its numerous predecessors, like the virginal. But Jawadi deliberately uses it in only specific circumstances. Across the franchise, he's established an association between solo piano and eerie, suspenseful situations. <laughs> I'm sorry, Rhaenyra. He does the same thing in the opening of Westworld, using the piano as a melodic instrument to similar effect for the cold, suspenseful tone. When he does this, the texture grows over time beyond just the piano, typically snowballing to some sort of climax, but overall, for Jawadi's audience, the piano is darkness, solitude, and suspense. So there's no better way to score this scene than a piano-dominated rendition of this motif representing Viserys and his struggle. There you go, that's your music analysis today. Please, sir. 
I want some more. More? Okay, someday. Alicent tells Otto that Viserys is dead and that he wanted Aegon to be king. Otto is mega skeptical because you would be, but he's obviously not going to ask questions. From a purely mechanical point of view, with the blacks out of the city the moment the king dies and Alicent fully believing that Aegon should be king, this is a huge win for Otto, but it isn't framed as a victory, nor does he treat it as such. He served Viserys on and off for 30 years, and now the fate of the kingdom rests on the actions he takes in the next day. This is dire. An emergency small council meeting is called, and Tyland Lannister is like, huh, oh, I was sleeping. He really has grown into his position, no longer the browbeaten bureaucrat, he's become a smug dipshit more befitting of his family name. What is it that could not await an hour? King's dead, bro. Oh, well now I look like a dickhead, don't I? Otto gives Viserys a dope nickname. We grieve for Viserys the peaceful. Before telling everyone about his third act change of heart to conveniently make Otto's grandson the king. I love how this scene is framed around Alice her emotions and her knowledge of the situation. She's grieving and anxious and unsure of how this is going to go. After all, she spent the last 16 years thinking that she's the only one who stands against Rhaenyra's claim. But then Tylan's like, oh, we're making Aegon King now? Cool. Plan A it is. And literally the first tab in his little binder is about doing exactly this. And Otto immediately jumps into the nitty gritty details concerning the control of the city watch. Bees! Bree and Westerling are like, huh? And Allison is like, wait, 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 you guys are already on this? Am I to understand that members of the small council have been planning secretly to install my son without me? You guys were gonna do a treason? Without me? And Jasper Wilde is like, oh yeah, we thought you'd be a buzzkill. And then Beesbury's like, yeah, <laughs> we didn't want you in our secret treason club. Wait a minute, there's a secret treason club? Ultimately, Beezus says he's just gonna stick with what the king was saying repeatedly for 20 years because Alicent just might have an ulterior motive. He starts accusing everyone of red ice and then he, oh. He's gonna be so oh, bees! Oh, 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 get it, move! They don't allow you to have bees in here. Cole just murders him. Whoops! Smashing his head through one of the cute little councillor balls. Bit of a faux pas there, mate. Lord Beesbury, a loyal worker, a truly humble bumble, cruelly murdered in a valiant effort to protect his queen, as all noble apids must. Killed by a representation of his loyalty to the crown. Lord Lyman, know as you rest that we shall not soon forget you. <laughs> Damn, now that's a buzzkill, because <laughs> bees go buzz and he killed him. Now that What's His Name is dead, Westerling isn't about any of this and starts waving his sword around, saying that Kyle is no longer fit to be Kingsguard. Decade and a half late there, mate. Alicent tells him to stop spitting his dummy, and Harold seems to take charge for a bit. As I come to this. Is he actually going to do something? As the single physically imposing person in the room, and the highest ranking knight in the kingdom, shouldn't he hold a lot of sway here? Hey, this appears to to be a violent coup. I'm sworn to defend the royal family. Can you guys maybe fucking stop or I'll imprison you all? Something like that maybe? Well, the meeting just continues, trying to sort out their allies across the kingdom, but reality is setting in for Alicent and she realizes that they're going to kill her best friend. What's of Rhaenyra? The council copes trying to justify this, but the king wouldn't wish for any of the king did not wish for the murder of his daughter. She puts this doofus in his place, but she doesn't have an alternative in mind. Lord Commander a westerling. Take your knights the Dragonstone. Be quick and be clean. Otto orders Westy to go murder Rhaenyra. I'm sorry, but this guy has eyes, doesn't he? Did he not see what just happened? He was there when Harold was Rhaenyra's sworn shield for presumably like a decade. And yet he's all, oh, I can't believe this, when the guy refuses. Instead of arresting or killing anyone, he just gives up his white cloak and walks out. Nobody leaves this room without my say so. The door remains shut until we finish our business. 
It's okay, I, he asked me earlier. So I love a lot about this scene, but parts of it are dumb, like Harold's behavior. I know they were going for a Barristan type thing where he steps out with pride, knowing that he's not supporting what he perceives to be treason, but refuses to lower himself to his subordinates level by doing violence at court. It's just weird that he doesn't do anything. Then there's the analogous scene in the book, which I think is stronger. The argumentation from the green counselors is more compelling and Beesbrig's death is more interesting. He tries to leave the chamber and then one of three things happened. Choose your own adventure. Orwile says Otto threw him in the black cells where he later died of a chill. Eustace says Jiminy Cricket slit his throat. And Mushroom says he slipped on a banana peel and slapsticked his way out of the window and onto the spikes below. In any case, it's certainly not the potentially unintentional heated gamer moment we see depicted here. He's got a bit of a volatile history. I, I don't really know if we should trust this guy with any more power. Kristen Cole will be named Lord Commander of the King's God. Oh dear. Elsewhere, Helena talks to her children and maid. It is our fate, I think, to crave always what is given to another. If one possesses a thing, the other will take it away. I love everything she says. Is she talking about Eamon being in love with her? Ah, oh. This is little Jaehaerys and Jahera, by the way. And look, she's stitching a spider. I know them from real life. Alicent and Otto burst in looking for Aegon. No clue why they think he'd be hanging out with his wife and children. Did you check wine? He's probably at wine. What's happened? Wait, you don't already know? Oh my God, imagine having to tell her this. No. There is a beast beneath the board. You know, at least they thought enough about the weird thing they did at the end of this episode to foreshadow it a bunch. You are the beast beneath the lords. I love everything about Helena. Don't fucking touch me. Aemond, no! Otto finds Aegon's sworn shield, Eric Cargill, who doesn't know where the prince is because he's a slippery bastard. Otto sends Eric and his twin Eric to find Aegon and deliver him specifically to him because of all that stuff I talked about earlier. I gotta say, the setup for the hunt is a lot of fun. Rainies, no! Everything you do is justified. They're imprisoning all the people who already know about Viserys' death to control the flow of information. Oh, hi, Larry. Alicent asks <laughs> to bring Aegon to her. Everything you feel for me is your queen. Oh, is this... What's going on here? Aemond tags along because he knows the specific piles of shit they're more likely to find Aegon in. He's such a good son. A good. He's just a good man in general. In keeping with his daemon standing, Aemond has taken up the patented up to no good hood, and we learn a bit about how Aegon's mind works, taking his brother to a fuck den the day he turned 13. Every woman is an image of the mother, to be spoken of with reverence. Spoiled c Nice one, Christo. Cole talks to the head whore and clearly has no fucking clue what he's doing. She doesn't have Aegon and tells them to come the fuck in or fuck the fuck off. Also, she boned Aemond when he was a wee lad. Thanks a lot, I really needed to know that. The actual funny connection here is that this lady was Fabian Frankel's drama teacher. Who actually, oddly, was my teacher at drama school. I was so nervous. Back on the street, Aemond speaks of Aegon's possible fleeing or even death. How things would improve, Aemond. Aegon wants nothing more than to run away from his responsibilities, as Chinsdale once offered to Rhaenyra. In the throne room, Otto has a bunch of dudes pledge loyalty to Aegon at gunpoint. Most people play along, except Lord Merriweather and Lady Fell stand up for Rhaenyra and get imprisoned for their efforts. Alan Caswell, who we've previously seen to be at the very least cordial with the princess, is clearly conflicted, but bends the knee. Long live the king. Laris do be looking. Caswell tries to get out the front fucking door, but somehow that doesn't work out for him. Laris reckons he was making a run for Rhaenyra and delivers him to Otto, which is interesting because we've never seen them work together before. Could be that he's hedging his bets, and Otto knows this. You've spent many hours with the Queen of late. He's seeing the power shifting between the King's hand and the Queen's feet. I have no love for the Princess. You liar, we've seen the way you talk to her. Thank you, Lord Caswell. Yeah, desperately in love. Anyway, where were we? Oh right, child fighting pits. Um, what the fuck? They grow their nails and file their teeth to make them into deadlier fighters? Why write this? Well, I guess it demonstrates Aegon's sadism. You see now what he is. It provides a bit of depth for King's Landing and gives Missaria something to complain about later. Oh, and some of the kids are his own. <laughs> 
Okay, maybe Rainy should have. I don't really get why all these people go to the trouble of this whole child fighting ring thing. If you want to see children fight to the death over nothing, you could just open Twitter. Aemond complains that Aegon would be a shit king and everyone knows it, and he would be way better. Desire the younger brother who studies history and philosophy. Desire who trains with the- <laughs> お前が女郎会をする間、俺は哲学を収めた。そして、お前が胸くそ悪い快楽を求めて、孤児の地下闘技場で日々を飛ぶに流す間、俺様は世界最強の兵器との絆を深めたんだ。Okay, complain about whatever you want. I don't care, but Aemond is fucking perfect. He's always making the internet cat face, and you cannot take that away from me. There's nothing silly about this. He's a very serious young man who should be king. He says, which in a technical sense is untrue as Aegon has two young sons, but if you watch this whole season and think that succession is clear and straightforward, you probably weren't watching. If Aegon's gone, I doubt Otto or Alicent would make little Jaehaerys the face of their regime, knowing that they're going to war with Rhaenyra. So we cut between the two parties talking about how much Aegon sucks. This lady tells the Cargills her boss knows where he is, but she'll only talk to Otto. Aemon and the other guy just fucking happened to stumble upon this meeting occurring? What are the chances of that? Otto seems to not really believe that Masaria is the head of this spy network. You yourself are the mysterious white. Well, I might take it. But once she says, My condolence is on the passing of your king. He immediately makes like Scotty at the Engadine Maccas after the 97 NRL Grand Final and cakes his Dax, because this is her telling him that she knows everything. And we saw how she found out too. When Alison's handmaiden Talia lit those candles in the window near the start of the episode, that was a message to Missaria. So they pay the lady and she starts talking. Very strangely. I thought... The prince is in Flibottom when no one is to be trusted. Next time call a head, man, cause now I look really wooed and I hate why I call my crops that way. Look, in episode two, I said her accent was fine because I thought it was, but the further we go on, what even is this? An obscenity. Either tolerated or ignored by the crown. So know you Mizuya's regular accent is English. Uh, I play Lily, who is a computer engineer. She's so fucking good, by the way. She doesn't say a word in Ex Machina and still gives a memorable performance. And here it's honestly commendable that she can still act convincingly while simultaneously inventing a new method of speaking every other line. If you want a more nuanced discussion about accents in this franchise and how they interact with the characters or actor's race, here's a Hills Alive video I might recommend. In essence... Oh. Okay. Anyway, she trades Aegon for human rights? I want an end to the savage use of children in Fleabottom. Masaria herself is a lifetime victim of abuse, but now has risen to become seemingly very wealthy and successful, and she uses her position to try and end the injustices she sees around her. Though she probably doesn't expect Otto to actually do anything about this, the message is clear. I could have killed him as easily as a wasp on fruit. And then... Well, there is no power, but what the people allow you to take. House of the Dragon is based. HBO back at it again with the socialist propaganda. The US military does more socialism by 9 a.m. than Venezuela does all day. Wait, you said that? I will remember. Alicent watches Viserys' body being wrapped up by the Silent Sisters and places his crown atop his corpse. She's fucking devastated, both by what's already happened and what she knows is yet to happen, moved by what must be a complex mix of grief, relief, and fear. Composing herself, she goes to visit Princess Rhaenys. As an empath, I can tell that your husband is dead. Because the Valarians are so powerful and have a couple of dragons, Alicent asks for Rhaenys' support, which, uh, yeah, um, I admire your your ambition. The princess initially scoffs, but then Alicent rattles off all the tragedy that's befallen her family since entwining with Rhaenyra's affairs, and yeah, fair cop. Then she tells Rhaenys those four and a half words she loves hearing from anyone who isn't her husband. You should have been queen. Oh yeah, that hits the spot. Hey, let's use our gentle, womanly influence to guide the men in charge away from violence and destruction. Alicent, 
Honey, you just outlined to Rhaenys all the things that she tried to warn Colise about with her gentle, womanly influence, and he did them anyway, and it broke her. As titillating as telling her she should have been queen is, she gave up on that a billion years ago. How did the gentle, womanly influence go for you when you found out the council had a whole coup planned without inviting you? Honestly, Eve Best is a killer, and this speech is sick. And yet you toil still in service to men. To have the illusion of power in a system where you can never truly have it. When I'm queen, I will create a new order. As Cersei said, Power is power. Have you never imagined yourself on the Iron Throne? Rhaenys is trying to incite a girl boss revolution and all the power to her. It seems she'd be great at that. Alicent is stunned by this. Within all likelihood, she has never even considered how she could get real power or what it would be like. She leaves Rhaenys to consider her offer. Ring the bell when you have an answer. Ring, ring, motherfuckers, here's your answer! So Aegon is in the last place anyone would ever look for him, a church. When they drag him out, he's all like, why the fuck would you do this? I want my mummy. They struggle him out of the sept, but Aemond and Chris... Merry Christmas, by the way, are there. Epic fight time. Aegon makes a dash for it, so Aemond chases after him and Eric just kind of watches, leaving the other two to fight. <laughs> oh, well, at least he's having fun. Aegon is canonically ticklish. Everyone is still in full agreement that Aegon should not be the king, but because he's got the oldest penis descended from Viserys, they just kind of do it anyway. Let me go. I will find a ship and sail away, never to be found. Aemond is so into that, but there's someone else here who owes everything to Alicent and isn't going to entertain that shit. Look how this situation is pitting brother against brother, twin against twin. Eric wanders off when he sees that Arik's support of Aegon isn't going to budge, no matter how terrible he knows he is. In a scene that's supposed to make you think of that one scene in that one episode, Alicent visits her pappy, who she has beaten in a game of thro- Oh my god, I just got that. And this is so cool. Whatever our differences, our hearts remain as one. <laughs> Oh, our hearts were never one. She takes a stand against her father, pointing out the ways that he manipulated her life for his own political gain. Rather, I've been a piece that you moved about the board. She sees that her hatred of Rhaenyra wasn't even real. It wasn't hers. It was manufactured by him to get what he saw was right. I understand your squeamishness. Reluctance to murder is not a weakness. There are those who would disagree, but it's so wonderful to see in this tumultuous situation, spurned on by Rhaenys' words, Alicent finally taking her own stance. Otto accuses her of reframing her own personal desires as Viserys' wishes, which is rich enough to buy a dragon egg coming from him, but she just goes ahead and takes charge. When she's done outlining her coronation plan, he looks upon her as an equal and exhibits pride in her. You look so much like your mother in certain lights. And then Otto concedes to his daughter. As you wish. Oh God, not this fucker again. Your grace. Today just will not end. I've got some exposition for you. We talked about the thing earlier, so now I'll just pretend that Alison doesn't even have feet. He tells her that Otto makes use of this spy network and that Talia is one of the spies. One of the little spiders is your lady in waiting. And the queen dies, the bees fly without purpose. First of all, too soon, man. And second of all, are they spiders or bees, Laris? It can't be both, so which is it? We take metaphor mixture very seriously here. You know what they say, Laris? If the shoe fits, it hasn't fallen far from the tree and it's worth two in the bush. What's a metaphor? I think it's like one more than a meta three. Interesting. But one less than a meta five. Anyway, Alicent asks Larry to kill Masaria so her dad won't know as many things. That she feels the need to do this sort of thing, to work with Laris at all, is a source of conflict for her. How can she say she's the side of morality and virtue in this conflict, while well, this is what lets her maintain influence? Oh god, he's pulling an egg on. Speaking of, he doesn't seem so happy. We see everyone having a quick little brood, check out Eamon's profile, holy moly, and Sir Eric swings by to free Rhaenys because he's had enough of this whole Aegon business. We later learn that Eric at some point managed to nab the crown from Viserys' corpse. Wish we saw that, or at least had any idea how that happened. Caswell, no! 
don't! You were too pure for this world! Oh, hi, Valerian. How you doing? Wait, does that mean that this is the same secret tunnel that Rhaenyra used? Judging from where they end up, I actually think it is. Hold on a moment! Rhaenys does a double take at Valerian. Oh my god, in addition to reminding her of Viserys, he reminds her of what gives her her own power. Rhaenys knows that making a window in the prison isn't going to solve any of this. This is what convinces her to use her power, her dragon, to smash through the prison and kill a bunch of randoms. And maybe she can show Alicent what that means too. Okay, I like that. Some dude with a firefly thing burns Masaria's house down because Larry said, but I'm too stupid to understand that. Masaria is a well-connected spy master and we don't hear any screams or see any corpses, so take that as you will. Thanks a lot, that was our only burlesque house. Suddenly, it's tomorrow. Rainy Swanty Dragon, but no, we've got to get on a ship. Eric says they shouldn't go to the Dragon Pit because the Greens will be expecting her there, but once a billion other people start going there, that doesn't seem to be much of a problem. They get sitcomed into following the crowd anyway, so... Yo, it's sheep time! We see some coronation preparation. Come at me, Eminem, with the oils and the speech written on a scroll. The Conqueror's Crown! The King Who Bore the Sword! All hail Aegon, second of his name! Sorry, I, um... Not sure what came over me there. He does not look wonderful. And he's so real about the whole thing. He had 20 years to name the heir. He never did. Steadfastly, he upheld the nearest claim. Alicent says, yeah, well, he told me he changed his mind. And Tom Glincarney burrows his way into my heart. He changed his mind. Wow. <laughs> no, he didn't like me. True. And he was right, you suck. But also, maybe it was sort of because of his neglect that you turned out like this. And he was neglectful because he was dead inside because of that time he murdered his wife to get a perfect prince out of her. And you aren't the perfect prince he wanted, so that probably didn't help anything. Aemond is, though. Good boy. Hey, you want this dagger? It was your dad's favourite. He loved how it represented the burden of Targaryen legacy and how you could do epic ninja moves with it to interrupt other people's plot lines. She hands him a dagger and then tells him not to do violence. We must not rule with cruelty and callousness. Mum is going on about all the things he needs to do as king, which I guess was the whole point of her getting him first, but he cuts to what's really important to him. Do you love me? I love this show. Now, does she respond like this because of course she loves him and it's silly that he asked? Yes. Does she respond like this because he clearly wasn't listening to her incredibly important directions about how to be king? Yes. Does she respond like this because she sees that she's simply recreating her own situation? Yes. Does she respond like this because, objectively, Aegon is an idiot? All of the above. Damn, when was the last time Rhaenys was in a mob? Ugh, oh, don't touch me, you smell poor. There are some absolutely gorgeous shots going into the dragon pit, wow. Otto announces Viserys' death. Small folk absolutely molding right now. Viserys the Peaceful is dead. It is pretty warming that this is how old man Vizzy is going to be remembered. As his spirit left us, he whispered his final wish that his firstborn son, Aegon, should succeed him. Look, Otto, when you phrase it like that, it sounds like complete bullshit. Okay, look, I'm always a sucker for diegetic music, so seeing these trumpets come out is great, but their usage is simply farcical. These are herald's trumpets, just long metal tubes with mouthpieces. There's no extra tubing, there's no valves or slides. The only pitches an instrument like this can play are the harmonics of the horn's inherent fundamental, which is determined by the thing's length. That's why most brass instruments curl around and shit, to extend the length and get a lower fundamental without being too physically cumbersome. We hear them playing this fanfare. <laughs> which basically uses the entire E minor scale. Now, because I'm really cool and popular and have a lot going on in my life, I took the time to figure out the fundamental of the shortest possible natural horn that would be able to play this tune, and found that it's G sharp zero, the note one semitone lower than a standard piano's range. 
These horns would need to be over 12 feet long to play this, and the players would need to use so much pressure that James Morrison's head would explode. So yeah, immersion fucking ruined. Boy, I really hope somebody got fired for that blunder. It's still pretty epic though. <laughs> this poor little useless c he doesn't want any of this, he's the real Jon Snow. You know how they say power should best belong to those who do not seek it? Well, Aegon is the best argument for no longer saying that sort of thing. Oh sorry, if you could just let me pass, I'm just gonna sneak out. Aegon is anointed in four of the seven oils. The three they leave out are the mother, the maid, and the stranger, so it seems they're deliberately avoiding associating his reign with femininity and death, and instead focusing on courage, authority, strength, and wisdom. Imagine getting your lord commander to crown you though. Shame. All the Aemons in the crowd absolutely seething right now. And Helena's looking at him. Mm. Okay, so there's this theory some viewers have that Aegon's kids are actually Aemons. You know, Helena talked about Aegon not really paying her any attention as his wife. Young Aemond spoke about how he wouldn't mind being married to her. He seems confident that he's next in line after Aegon, some other stuff. I get it, but I kind of hope it's not true. I hope their love for each other is completely normal, regular sibling stuff. They are Targaryen though, so bleh. Okay, the crown really ties his whole fit together. Aegon II has passed the drip check. The crown literally is too big for him because symbolism is fun. King of the Andals and the Roinar and the First Men. Oh, the Roinar, do you say? Hmm. Yeah. Go, what's his name? Yeah, all right. Woo! Yeah, Go I love dragon. the king. Yeah, that's it. Generic yeah, cheering king. noises. You guys want yeah. any crack? Okay, the cheers of 10,000 peasants will make you more enthused about anything. Blackfire looks sick. This adaptation of the Targaryen theme is awesome. The way they timed the tubular bells to his thrusting of the sword. <laughs> Clever. This shot! And just as it seems things might work out all right for the greens, is, is the beast beneath the ball. Melis, no! All right, nobody move. I got a dragon here and I'm not afraid to use it. I'm a donkey on the head! She's so pretty and chaotic, I love her. All complications aside, it's really interesting to see how a dragon plays out in an environment like this. Stop running, she just wants to play! Open the door! Open the door! Wait, why are they even closing them? That's weird. Get to the Alicent puts herself in front of Aegon, which probably does a lot to solidify Rhaenys' respect for her as a mother, and she commands Costco to protect Helena, because she knows Aemond can protect himself from an enormous fucking dragon, and Otto has lived long enough already. The Red Queen lets loose a thunderous roar. <laughs> But instead of immolating the entire family and making herself an accursed king-slaying kinslayer, Rhaenys bows to the Green Queen and goes about her merry way. So yeah, she's a mass murderer, a domestic terrorist, all that crazy stuff. Good going, Queen. But dude, blame the rider, not the steed. Melis is so cool. You know what? The initial reaction to this was so bombastic, I really couldn't think clearly. But it's not that crazy. In terms of character motivation, I think everything's pretty above Above board. You can think Rhaenys is an evil monster for this, you probably should, but as Masaria told us earlier in the episode, there is no power but what the people allow you to take. The small folk do not readily forget this sort of thing, unless Cersei does it for funsies. So yeah, overall I think it is the weakest episode so far. It contains two really lackluster scenes that could have been so much more, and I think of the main conflict of the episode as kind of iffy. Producer oversight into the right is something to be wary of, especially with a writer's strike going into the near future. But I don't think we're yet approaching levels of incompetence that are comparable to late Game of Thrones. The council scene should have been better, the climax is weird on the face of it, but the show's still good. Anyway, I just lost the game, so see you next time. Um, there's still a merch store. I thought I'd mention that. <laughs> You have disrupted my plans for the last time, old man. And hey, now you will suffer to avoid wet wobble. Wet wobble. Wow.